During the pandemic, many colleges and universities embraced a form of blended learning called HyFlex to mixed reviews at best. Is it likely to be part of colleges' instructional strategies going forward? Hello, and welcome to The Key, Inside Higher Ed's news and analysis podcast. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed and host of The Key. Happy fall, and thanks for being here. Today's conversation is about high flex learning in which students in a classroom learn synchronously alongside a cohort of peers studying remotely. High flex, which blends the terms hybrid and flexible, has been around for more than 15 years, offered primarily in graduate courses. But it moved from something of a fringe phenomenon to the mainstream, at least temporarily, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as colleges brought students back to their physical campuses but needed to provide flexibility so that students who were sick or otherwise unable to return to their classroom could continue their educations. The experience was, to put it kindly, imperfect. Professors struggled to teach equitably both to those in the physical classroom and to those studying remotely. Today's episode explores whether high flex remains a viable option at a time when many students want more flexibility in when and how they learn, and many colleges continue to experiment with new ways of reaching potential learners. I'm joined for the discussion by two professors who have both taught in the high flex format and done research on its impact. Anilva Romero Hall is an associate professor in the Learning Design and Technology Program at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, who started teaching high flex before the pandemic and got her PhD in a doctoral program that utilized high flex. Alana Gillis is an assistant professor of sociology at St. Lawrence University, who had her first high flex experience during the pandemic. Those experiences clearly shaped their views, as you'll hear in a minute. Before we begin, here's a quick message from Kaplan, which is the sponsor of this week's episode. This episode of The Key is sponsored by Kaplan, which serves as a multi-purpose strategic partner to universities across the globe, delivering more than $1 billion in annual economic impact to its partners by helping them grow, diversify, and innovate. Here's my discussion with Anilda Romero-Hall and Alana Gillis. Anilda and Alana, welcome to The Key. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for having us. Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and how you come at this conversation about HyFlex. Uh, Anilda, maybe start with you. I am an associate professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I come to this conversation as someone who has been a student in a high flex format. I was, I did my doctoral degree in a high flex format, uh, but then um, during the pandemic and actually a little bit prior to the pandemic, I've also had some experience teaching in a high flex format and um, then transition to also investigating more about um, this type of instructional modality. So doing some research and, and publishing a little bit on the topic. Alana. So I'm an assistant professor in sociology at a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And so all of my experience from this is coming from teaching undergraduate courses in sociology about inequality. I didn't start using HyFlex. I wasn't aware of its existence until the pandemic, like many instructors. And I taught five out of the six of my courses in the 2020-2021 year um, in high flex modality with basically no training. But I got to the point where, um, you know, I sort of understood the basics enough that I was starting to informally coach some of my colleagues on it. And I, you know, ultimately conducted some research about it, try to sort of understand it in this undergraduate context, particularly issues around equity and engagement. It's perfect because you both are uh, typical. I think, Alana, you're, I think you're right that you're probably more typical in having been introduced to this during the pandemic, probably not under the best circumstances. And and Anilda, you have a little bit more experience and probably done under better conditions, which maybe affects how you both come at this. And so maybe Anilda, why don't you start in a little bit by talking about what your experiences have been and how you view HyFlex as an emergent instructional model in times of emergency, which is obviously part of how it's used, but I think, you know, hopefully those are going to come and go and we'll see how it works as an instructional model generally. 
As a graduate student, I was very fortunate. I did my uh, doctoral degree at Old Dominion University, and they have the Gorton Building, which is fully dedicated to high flex instruction. And you know, it has is outfitted with all the technology and the support, technological support that is needed in that type of modality. So you have individual microphones for e- every student. You have cameras that follow students around. It does take a significant amount of commitment from the the instructor. And it also needs um, a lot of attention in terms of how many students will you have in your classroom in that type of um, environment? Um, How many students do you have in presence with you? And how many students are online? And and how do you engage those two students? Like, um, do I have a a monitor in which I can see my classmates at a distance? And then I have a different monitor in which I can see the instruction. So that was my experience as a graduate student, which was completely different to my experience as an instructor teaching in times of pandemic, in which I was in a classroom and all I have is my computer station. I have students who are face-to-face and there's no way for them to see each other or we're managing just one classroom. So the way I see it, in times of pandemic, institutions were trying to make magic happen with very limited resources. So it was not the same experience. It was not the same um, social presence in the classroom. Um, There's not the same level of communication. There's probably uh, feelings of isolation for some of the students who are not being brought into the classroom discussion in a way that is equitable for everyone who wants to participate and communicate. There's also the pedagogical challenges of how do I maneuver assignments um, and activities for my students face-to-face versus those that are online. Having had experience as a student, but participating in a high-flex classroom in good circumstances, were you able to bring tactics or strategies to bear on the imperfect situation that you had as an instructor uh, that gave you uh, you and maybe your students an edge over those who were dealing with this for the first time? And if so, can you share what any of those might be? I have experienced teaching online, and I feel like that brought in a different perspective for me. I think that having those uh, that knowledge and experience and having some um, experience teaching online does give me some knowledge and, and skills that I brought in to think, okay, well, you know, there's this power dynamic between my students that are face-to-face who may dominate the conversation versus the students who are online who want to engage in the conversation, and how do I make space for the students that are online. Also, how do I anticipate what students are going to be face-to-face versus what students are going to be online? Because that's the hybrid flexibility of the modality, right? So trying to plan for that was also something that I had to think about. In terms of uh, simple things like hardware, um, like I had to go to my IT department and ask them for um, a speaker that I could pass around my students so that the students in the back of the classroom could be easily hear by those that were online as well. So there were things that because of that experience, I was able to consider and um, accommodate for. And I think that it made for a decent experience given the circumstances. But I do want to um, to say that I, I felt that Institutions were trying to stretch too much in times in which really everyone was just trying to survive. To some extent, some of us are still just trying to survive. Alana, you as an instructor, I know you are not hidebound. You seem to have done a fair bit of online teaching. So it's not like you came into this as somebody who'd only lectured for 40 years or whatever. Like, I think those are some of the people who had the hardest time with this transition. Tell us a little bit about sort of your experiences and how they shape your views on HyFlex. Having never had the experience as a student, there not being very many resources. I think a lot of the literature was a lot more about graduate programs that have done this. In particular, I, as an instructor, was really concerned about ideas around how to do active learning activities and build class community and sociology. In my courses talking about inequality, I'm constantly having us engage with these really deep critical ideas And the only way that students are really going to be willing to open up and explore these topics is if they feel 
like a safe part of a community. And how do you do that if that community is not together, either all online together or all in the classroom together? And so at first, I was thinking through this problem in terms of technologically. All my university provided was a good microphone, a good speaker, a document camera. So they sort of provided the basics that we needed. The classrooms were small enough that students could generally speak up from the back of the classroom and still be heard. But my big thing is I have students spend a lot of time working in small groups. And so my question was, how do I structure those small groups? And, you know, at first I was trying to have students. So students in the classroom would bring their laptops or use a phone and join Zoom to participate in small group discussions that way so that we were actually bridging and connecting the community between the students who were remote and the students who were in person. But what I found is that the students in person really resented that. They absolutely despised having to talk to their remote peers. And as a result, they talked a lot less and they talked about how uncomfortable it was to be in a classroom where maybe their group was still talking, but other groups were done or the people in the classroom weren't the ones speaking. And so they're speaking into silence and they hated it. And so they participated less. And so I started thinking through, okay, next semester, how can I adapt this in different ways? You know, I still want there to be that cohesive class community. And so the next semester, you know, I did more of sometimes they had to talk to remote peers, sometimes they could talk to other students who were in person. And, you know, I really never found that balance. Because then when I tried in a different course, having remote students talk to each other, in-person students talk to each other, the remote students rightly felt they weren't truly part of the classroom experience. For me, that was a big problem, not just because those students weren't learning as much or, you know, really weren't able to be part of those core conversations as much, but also in terms of the equity issues, who are the students who are likely to be remote compared to in-person? Those are the students who are struggling more socioeconomically. And so they're having the transportation issues or they're, you know, having to balance working more for pay. Um, and making it harder to come into the classroom, or in particular, students with physical or mental health disabilities, that they're having to miss class because of some of those disabilities. And I was finding that those were the students who were then getting the worst experience. And so to me, I felt like I was really doing this a disservice where students who most sort of needed the extra support were sort of getting the worst end of it. It's really hard as an instructor, we're human beings. And when there's a face in front of us in the classroom, it's really hard to not cater to what those people are most wanting. And I used tricks. Like I said, things in full class discussions, we're going to trade off every other time. Like if someone in class has just spoken, we're going to wait until someone on Zoom speaks. I mean, there's tricks you can use, but at the end of the day, it didn't feel like a cohesive community and it didn't feel like everyone got and equal education. I believe that, especially when students don't know what they're getting into or they're being told that this is what they're going to have when that's not really the experience that they sign up for, I think that brings this level of challenges because um, I imagine that a liberal college institution, students are expecting a full face-to-face type of instruction. They were not signing up for high flex instruction. There was something that was done because of the pandemic and managing the number of students that were in the classroom. So I feel that that already brings on many different challenges. This is not what I signed up for. There's really two conversations here. There's how effective was high flex as a practice in these emergency times. And I don't think there's a lot of doubt that it was really mixed at at best. Hard for instructors, for all the reasons you you guys have cited, and not a good experience for students. And I I don't think we can underestimate what you talked about, Anilda, about sort of expectations. Uh, None of us do particularly well when we're thrown into situations that weren't of our choosing. And that's what a lot of the pandemic era education was all about. So it's fine to think and talk about the use of high flex going forward, but we are moving ahead. And the question I'm most interested in is to what extent 
is HyFlex a viable instructional mode going forward? And there will certainly continue to be times when colleges might benefit from using this format as one strategy in those situations in an era that isn't characterized first and foremost by emergency situations. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot is student choice. Even many of the students who didn't like what they experienced educationally during the COVID-driven last couple of years liked the flexibility of when and how they learned. I do think there's going to be more interest among students in at least having options. And HyFlex is obviously one way of giving students flexibility, but only if it's a good option. So I'd love it if we could shift a bit in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I think about going forward, HyFlex, I think, made sense in some of the conditions that we had in the pandemic. But one of the big questions that I do have going forward is, does this truly bring something that we need that goes beyond the tools that we would have otherwise? So for instance, if we're thinking about, okay, if the response is like, we create community among the remote students, and then among the in-person students, Why is that answer not just you teach some courses in person and some courses remotely? Like what does high flex bring that a fully remote course couldn't bring that level of flexibility when it's needed? Because in that case, I think from the instructor standpoint, it feels kind of like teaching two different classes. You're having to manage different styles, like different modalities of learning. You're having to basically manage different classroom communities all within one class which is not only more difficult for the instructor, it also just takes a lot more time, time that's generally not compensated extra. And so I think one of the questions that I think about is what does this truly offer something that can't be had with just continuing to refine our existing modalities in terms of you know, remote instruction for students who need to be tending remotely? It sounds like what you're saying is you think it would be preferable to just say, in this course, we're going to have a section or sections that are in person and a section or sections that are taught remotely, and you can do one or the other. Putting aside those who are going to continue to have true need, COVID, disability, whatever, for flexibility. I guess what I'm what one of the things I'm trying to get at is how much should institutions be expected to pr- provide or you know this more skeptical view might be cater to students who just want to be able to decide on a particular morning I don't want to commute 20 miles to class today I'd rather attend remotely. And I think we've seen institutions largely returned to the pre-pandemic days of just saying, this course is at 10 a.m., be there or be square. And I'm, I don't know. I don't, that's one of the things I'm still uncertain of is what is whether and how much student expectations have changed and how much institutions are going to be expected to respond to it. So Nilda, how how do you think about some of this stuff? My perspective is a little bit different because um, in my experience, High flex can provide um, opportunities and experiences for students, um, not for just students that want to uh, decide in the morning off, do I want to go in person or do I want to attend from my home? But it provides opportunities for students who may be in Alaska and want to take a class from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. It can provide opportunities for students who are abroad for military service or something and wanna join your class um, at your institution in the United States. So it's not just for students who are there locally, it's for students who are literally in other geographical regions, uh, in rural areas where they may not have access to the type of course or a program that may be offered at those institutions. So I think that there's a different perspective that we need to consider as well. Um, I do agree that it does require a tremendous amount of uh, work on the part of the instructor. And I also think that um, there's a lot of resources and support that institutions need to think about. So I think moving forward, the conversation really needs to be at the institutional level um, as to how do, how do we 
want to envision HyFlex at our institution? What are the resources that our faculty going to need? What are the resources that students going to need in order, in order to make this happen? And again, those resources can be infrastructure that is gonna need to be allocated for this type of instruction. Um, some of those resources may need to be uh, professional development for faculty. It may be additional instructional design staff that needs to be hired to support faculty that are going to be teaching in that format. And it may also need to be instructional technology support that are going to ensure that students who are remote can join in, that can ensure that classrooms are properly equipped and are functionally adequately when classes are in session. So I think that those are the conversations that we need to have moving forward. This episode of The Key is sponsored by Kaplan, which serves as a multi-purpose strategic partner to universities across the globe, delivering more than $1 billion in annual economic impact to its partners by helping them grow, diversify, and innovate. I'm speaking today with uh, Alana Gillis of St. Lawrence University and Anilda Romero-Hall of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Anilda, the benefits that you ascribe to HyFlex in terms of access for people who are place-bound, et cetera, are some of the historical benefits that we've long linked to online learning generally. So one solution for the student you described uh, being in Alaska is just making sure that there's an online section or a online course available for students like that. What we're really talking about, to me, is a sense of purposefulness. Are we doing high flex for a reason because we think it's got either pedagogical or access learning advantages as opposed to a fix that we think may or may not be the right fix or the best fix? Alana, thoughts about that? So I'm thinking about this in terms of, you know, exactly what you were just raising is what is the problem that we're facing and is HyFlex the right answer? Because I think we can make HyFlex work well enough, but does that mean that it should be something that we're investing money into? I mean, we know that we're in a huge era of austerity for higher education. And so having discussions about the ideal training and technology that's necessary for HyFlex that's a lot of money that universities would not be investing in something else. And so to me, it's really important that we don't just say, what do we need to make high flex work? We take a step back and say, what are the problems that our students are facing and what are the best ways to solve them? And if high flex is the answer, then we need to make sure we're investing all of those very things that, that she was just talking about. But if instead those lead us to different solutions, then I think that, you know, jumping on the bandwagon of saying technology can solve these problems without considering whether they should be solved a different way, there already is somewhat, and there's going to be an increasing tendency to use high flex to over-enroll courses that typically met in person. You know, you were bound to the number of students who could sit in that physical space. And instead with high flex, you can dramatically increase the course size and still have that professor teaching the same number of courses. The number of courses isn't going to change, but now they're essentially just teaching two classes, but only getting paid for one. And so it worries me that high flex could be a way to continue to actually promote austerity in ways that are going to be worse for students' education rather than better if we're not focusing on what is the problem that we're trying to solve here. Yeah. So, so Nilda, I want to, yeah. Uh, um, so the situation you described about your doctoral program sounds like the optimal use of high flex in many ways. You all went in knowing what it was all about and and had made that choice. It provided access to people who were potentially far flung. I don't know. You can tell us that. And it was done right with the technology, with the training, et cetera. It certainly seems like that use of it makes sense going forward to the extent it's all sort of planned. The larger question and the reason I wanted to have this conversation because it's something I've been thinking about a lot is the problem that HyFlex clearly is a solution to is the one I was describing before of 
students wanting flexibility and institutions trying to find a way to provide it, that may or may not be a good enough reason to do it. And it's certainly not going to be a good solution if it's not done well. So anyway, I'm just curious how you're thinking about that. First of all, I want to say that I never see technology as the solution. I am always the kind of person that is skeptical uh, and always thinking about different paths. So technology is definitely not always the solution to all of our problems. Um, I do think that when we think about high flex, it really is uh, what you just mentioned. It's just giving that student that flexibility and that option of considering the ways in which they can come into, you know, their learning experience. I believe for some student, it just provides that additional level of social presence. Not all students want asynchronous instruction. Many students have given their opinion and what they really want is some sort of balance in between asynchronous and synchronous sessions in which they can come together with other individuals, whether it is virtually or sharing a physical space and interacting with them. Because again, they just want to have that level of social presence in the classroom. So I think that that it really is the reason why we engage in HyFlex, um, because it provides access, because it provides social presence for students, it gives them flexibility. But I also think that instructors, institutions need to think about whether that is something that they are prepared to, to offer to the students and whether it fits for their student body. At some institutions, that may not be the, you know, the format that they need to go because that's not why students go to that specific institution. In that institution, students go for, you know, they want the face-to-face instruction. In other institutions, in other contexts, students want online asynchronous instruction. So again, there needs to be an understanding of what are the needs of the students and what are the possibilities and support that the institution need to provide to their faculty. And they certainly need to decide if they're going to offer it, they need to do it right. And they need to do all the things that both of you have talked about in terms of the right technology in the in the classrooms, the right preparation of instructors, the right preparation of students. And Lana, back to you. I think another thing, if we're thinking about what do universities need to do it right, is not just thinking about the technology Um, that's needed in the classroom, but also the technology that students need access to. To me, it's totally impractical to think about doing high flex if your students don't have access to the technology that's necessary. And to me, like, I mean, does this mean we need to be providing like technology stipends to students? You know, it depends entirely on your student body, but I work at a institution that has a generally wealthy student body. And even some of those students, I mean, their computer breaks, their internet goes out. They have power outages that my area doesn't have because they're in a different area. And so even among like a more financially well-off student body, I had significant technology issues that usually happened on student end, not my end. In addition to having a space where they could actually join class that was private and quiet enough to do so. And so students who are sharing rooms with roommates or who are in their family homes where the dog is barking in the background, their younger siblings are working in the background. They then, you know, felt like they couldn't participate in class because it was so loud and it wasn't private. And so I think that we also have to make sure that students actually have the resources, both technology and spaces where they can meaningfully join class. I mean, I, every student in my class remembers the infamous time where there was a student who all of a sudden his roommates are walking in the background in his underwear. And like that student then didn't engage well for several weeks. He was so embarrassed about it. We have to think about, do do the students have the resources they need? And instead of institutions assuming they do, we would need to build that into any policies. Do you think institutions like St. Lawrence and others need to be thinking more about different modes of instructional delivery if we should be providing 
students with more options for when and how they get their learning? I guess maybe, first of all, do you think we should? And if so, what might be better options for providing that? And then I'll go back to Anilda. So I do think that this varies so much by institution type. And so I you know, can speak to what I've experienced at a small liberal arts college, again, that has, it has a residential component, except during the pandemic year, students are required to live on campus all four years. Students are paying enormous amounts of money to come here, and they do expect the in-person education. And so I think for institutions like mine, I think the question is more so how can we adapt the modalities that we have so that we're actually meeting student needs better? And so professors who still have attendance policies that say, if you miss two classes, you know, your letter grade's gonna drop by this much. If you miss three classes, it's gonna drop by this much are absolutely not reflecting the realities that students have today. And so I think that we do need to be thinking about additional ways that our students can engage and learn And we need to be building those into our policies so that we're creating equitable policies so that students of all opportunities, all resources, all health statuses are able to meaningfully engage. And so when my students have to miss class for several weeks because they, you know, one of them is having heart issues and is potentially about to have heart surgery. I mean, the answer for her isn't high flex. The answer for her is she needs to take some time off of class and then have meaningful ways to be able to make that back up. I mean, a lot of these traditional policies were never equitable to begin with, but we're finally recognizing that. And I think that we need to do more to push to make sure that we have more flexibility within our in-person instruction, because there's really not demand at institutions like St. Lawrence for remote learning. That's not why students are there. One of my worries about the increasing expansion of high flex is the worry that it's going to reproduce ableist assumptions that students should always be in class. Because the idea is if you can join class from anywhere, a lot of professors are treating that as, okay, well, then there's almost no good reason to miss class. And so students across the country have tried to join high flex classes from their hospital beds, from family homes at funerals, because they feel like they're supposed to be joining class because there's this opportunity to. And I worry that by providing this increased access, it's creating this mindset where just because you know, you're not physically able to be in the classroom doesn't mean there's not an excuse for you to be here. And of course, individual instructors, I mean, I can tell my students again and again, please focus on your recovery, don't come to class. But overwhelmingly, these students are receiving these pressures from somewhere that they're still supposed to be trying to join regardless of those circumstances. And so I think one of the things we have to be careful about is making sure that we still provide an opportunity to say, there's actually still times where you shouldn't come to class. Anilda, last word. I've looked into the literature of high flex instruction significantly. And I think that Alana brought in a great point about um, the number of students that would be allowed to be in a high flex classroom and what exactly what decisions institutions are making about what classes are we going to have? How many students are we going to allow? Should we increase the number of students? And I feel that Those are conversations that need to occur between administration and faculty, and there is definitely a strong need to do further research at institutions that are doing high flex and are doing it right. And what are they doing that can be replicated at other institutions? Uh, What can we take from their experiences and what are the challenges that they face? We are having this conversation because we have a lack of research and that's what we need to do. We need to do more research on this topic. Um, so I think that there are many challenges that we have still yet to, um, to understand and to clarify. Um, do we need to think that this is an approach that all institutions need to take? Um, I definitely think that that's not it. Uh, we need to think about context and we need to think about how different contexts can consider high flex and others may, it may not be what they need to do. That was Anilda Romero Hall, Associate Professor in the Learning Design and Technology Program at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Alana Gillis, Assistant Professor of Sociology at St. Lawrence University, discussing their experiences with high flex learning 
and their suggestions for when and how colleges might use it effectively going forward. I'm finding myself a bit obsessed with questions about what students want from their colleges and universities educationally now and in the future, and what institutions can and should be providing. I have way more questions than answers, and I'm hoping that putting these questions out there and inviting those of you who have thoughts of your own to share them with me is helpful as you work through all of these issues on your campuses. Whether you're an individual faculty member thinking about whether HyFlex is the best approach for your own classroom, or a campus administrator or staff member trying to plot your institution's strategy, I hope this discussion has provided a little bit of insight. That's all for this week's episode. I'll be back next week with a conversation with Anya Kamenetz, taking a look back at her 2010 book, DIYU. Until then, I'm Doug Letterman. Stay well and stay safe.